In a bid to encourage renunciation, the Sokoto state government has granted amnesty to about 8,000 suspected ghost workers uh, on its payroll. Now, Alhaji Abdul Sahmad Dasuki, the finance commissioner, and the acting chairman of Sokoto State um, stated that this was because they wanted them to come forward without fear of punishments. Interesting. Well, joining us to discuss this, I still have in the studio Daniel Odupe and Christian Wogu, both lawyers. I'll start with you, Daniel. So, 8,000 ghost workers, money paid to people who don't work. There's no value added to the service. Uh, and instead of going to the books or looking for other ways to get these ghost workers, we're giving them amnesty. We're begging them to come forward for, without fear of punishment. Please help me understand how you should act from lawfully treat people who are ghosting when they're supposed to work. Absolutely. Like you said, um, you know, punishment ought to be meted out to them, no doubt. But for me, what I find most surprising about this entire story is the solution that the commissioner came up with. For me, it's hilarious. In the 21st century, where you have, where you have um, devices and you can use, you, know, you can use these damn means to ascertain, get figures, you want to grant amnesty just to know, just to find out the identity of your ghost water. Look, as in, it's just, for me, it's just, I can't, as in, it's really shocking to me that that is the only, that is the best solution an entire state can come up with in identifying ghost workers. You pay them salary, they receive a last day, I, I, you have an account where you I want to play the devil's advocate for a second. <sighs> Maybe Sakwato State might not have the kind of apparatus that the Lagos State government might have in sieving out who a ghost worker might be from, you know, the entire service. So maybe that's why they're deciding to use this manual, you know, way of trying to ask them to come forward. Nothing's going to happen to you. We just want to know why you did this. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's incredible with all the resources. I, I mean, for me, it's not, I smell something fishy. It just doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense. In the situation, an entire state, how much would it cost to be able to I mean, you have you are paying this money into bank accounts. I be how do they pay? I, I want to believe they are not paying. They are not having to catch them. Of course. So, yeah. so, so obviously, so you are paying into bank accounts. Yeah, these are banks that KYC responsibility. I mean, I can think of five different ways you can get people. I mean, it's just incredible. It's, it doesn't make any sense. It's 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 an insult. I mean, if this kind of thing, I, I can I imagine you know gets to people from other part of the world. They just look at us and say these guys are just not serious. I mean, it's shameful to say the least that this kind of thing is coming out. I mean, it just. It just doesn't make any sense at all. I mean. A lot of people have said, Vice Wogo, that the reason why the governments in several states are unable to pay the minimum wage, not to talk of the new one, is because there's so many relevant people in the service who are not adding value to the service, and the, the, the civil service across the Federation needs to be chopped down. Could, it, could, <laughs> could that also be the reason why Sakoto State is having this issue because I'm wondering if you are having people ghost, 8,000 is a lot of people, and then that's money that could be put to better use. Wouldn't it be simpler to just find other ways to deal with these people, send them home, and maybe give the jobs to other people who can do it, or put the money in another, invest it in something else that could better the loss of the state? Yeah, now, see, my understanding of these ghost workers is a situation where people don't, who don't exist are being paid money. That means that they are ghosts. They, are, they don't exist, but somehow, let's say there is an Adamu Peter who is receiving salary, but that Adamu Peter, in actual fact, does not exist. That means somebody is collecting the money of Adam Peters. But there is a civic, I, I used to work in the service years ago. There is a civic com. I don't know if it's still alive. There are time books. You, again, I didn't work in the gen, I worked in, under the Ministry of Information. You have a time book where you sign in and sign out. You're supposed to know who works in, I don't know. I mean, I, that's exactly where I'm coming so to. So should we be waiting for people yeah, to because, show up? Because if I had an opportunity to meet Dasuki, I'll be asking Dasuki, if you had a company, you had an industry, 
would you be waiting for the people? In fact, you will, first of all, you give them amnesty so that they can come in your company and then you will now forgive them. You can see that all of these are just laughable. And um, look, I, 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 I did a quick calculation and that means that about 2.4 million at an average of 20,000 per ghost worker cannot be accounted for every month. And that is where it is, just 20,000. Depending on who, yeah. yeah. So if it gets up to 400,000 times, you can see how much is being filtered away. Because somebody is not doing his work and cannot come up and accept that, look, this whole thing, I can't do it. What is it in, like um, my learned colleague mentioned, what is it in, in registering that's, the banks have gone through the BVN. You can't do anything in the bank. There is not going to be any ghost person operating a bank account with BVN. So it, there are things that you can put in place. Now, you mentioned the fact that because, uh, like, Lagos State doesn't have, but it's, it, there are two states in there. So if they don't have, they should come and learn from the state that is doing it. They are really conscientious about this. And you know that this issue of ghost workers is not exclusive to um, Sokoto State. Of course. It's Even been, the Federal Civil Service is, yeah, is, is it's been something running across. So I want to believe that some people profit through these things. And maybe the people telling us they are looking for ghost workers may be culpable at some point or the other. I, I'm wondering if we're serious about it, yes. because Nigeria is not a, I don't necessarily think that we are really a third world country. I mean, I've been to other African countries and we're doing way better with respect to all the other African countries. So can we be saying that it's beyond us to come up with means of fishing out ghost workers, whether at the federal or state levels, being that we're complaining about money, we're complaining about output and value added in the civil service. Is, is it beyond us to get rid of these ghost workers? Exactly my point. Uh, exactly my point. You know, from the economic point of view, the more economical thing to do is to fish them out. Look at the quick maths that you just did. So you're losing how much per month? How much will it cost you to put things in place? I think there's, there's high level insincerity. That's the point. This high level Let's just face it. How much will it cost you to fish out those? It's just, and then for me, it's, it's, it's a slap. It's like you're abusing, you're insulting, you're insulting to intelligence to make this kind of scandalous statement that, oh, you want them to, you want to get, grant them amnesty. It's, 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 because how much does it cost, will it cost you? If, if, let's assume that they don't even know what to do, really. How much will it, how quickly, or how, how long will it take you to find out from those who should know? Expert, those who can do forensic audits and what have you, that, that they can help you get the information as quickly as possible. How much will it cost you compared to how much you are losing by time? And then you're talking about productivity. We said that, you know, I, pro, I absolutely agree with that. How much, you know, how overbloated uh, civil services and how, how that you need to reduce, you know. These are serious discussions. And if you look at budgetary allocation, both at the state and the national level, every year, incredible amount of money goes to you know, this civil service that is doing next to nothing that, you know, so it just shows that we're not serious. We are really not serious. We don't mean business. Like he said, if this were your personal business, if you're a profit, and that's how government job should be, you should treat it as though it's your personal business. Because in a sense, when you are there, you are, do, you know, it seats your personal business for that, for that time being, you know, for the time being. So if you, if it were your personal business, I mean, if, if it was to be a dangote or any of these big business tycoon, would we have that kind of money to be going down the drain? Wouldn't you to do something about it? And that's how government jobs should be treated. That's how government civil service should be, should, should be treated. So we're just not serious. We don't mean business. We just, we just play around. We play Let me much. digress a little. Um, every time the idea or the talk of reducing the civil service and seeing, keeping those who add, really add value, labor comes in. How, how do you even fight labor off to do the best because whether we like it or not, this might be in the best interest of the nation at large. There are a lot of people. I'll give, a, I'll give an example. When I used to work uh, in the civil service, I had colleagues, one of them was working in the auditing department who would just show up for work and sign his name in and then carry his bucket of meat pie and head to town and then doesn't show up till later and then signs himself out. You haven't added any value. 
And for me, it used to bother me that. So what do you do? You say you work here. What do you do? Because I come here and I work, but I don't see. So, and then there are the people who are, you know, there to cover up for them who are also culpable. How do you even break through all of this? Because it seems to be a cabal of sorts of in the civil service without being the bad guy. Yeah, um, from my point of view, I want to aggregate the entire challenge of Nigeria to the failing of the civil service. How so? Yes. Now, first is, let's start with the budget. You find that the civil service consumes about 80% of the Nigerian budget, and they are just less than 1% of Nigerian, of Nigerian population. So already, and then they are not adding um, value um, proportionate to, in fact, they are not just even adding value. Now, I don't believe the civil service is bloated. I believe that people who know what to do and who should do them are just being irresponsible, just like your colleague. And we have, we have like maybe 80% or 90% of similar colleagues in wherever you find a civil servant in Nigeria. So you find that they take a lot of money and they don't add value. So at the end of the month, that colleague comes and takes salary and there are just many of them like that. Now, there are certain other um, people in the civil service who are regimented, like the forces. Now, they account for almost every second that they put in there. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of the regimentation. There is a command. There is enforcement. Uh, those kind of people will not tell you that they are bloated. They would rather need more people. Mm -hmm. Now, so we need to get down to where each civil servant gives account of every earning that that person has. But and that's that why we had Servicom. And uh, Servicom was yes. brought in to show people to to make people accountable of their now, service. The Servicom is, is operated by who? Uh-huh, yes. Yeah, That's the point. Uh -huh. Now, so you find that in those nations where Nigerians want to go and have good life and real life, simply because civil service work there. That's, that's, that's just the missing point. Most of the hospitals that are serving Nigerian leaders are council hospitals. That is like our local government mm -hmm. here having a hospital mm -hmm. that works and then is able to serve medical tourism. So we need to get down to that Nigeria. If civil service, if civil service works in this country, Nigeria is healed. Even IMEC is healed, because <laughs> IMEC is civil service. OK, quickly, um, because we're about to uh, wrap this up. So Daniel, can we ever, will we ever be able to get to that Uhuru when it comes to getting our civil servants to be accountable. Because whether we like it or not, the political appointees are per time. They come, it's just one person. But the whole body or the ministry or the department or agency is made up of civil servants. So when we say a politician is corrupt, it means that somebody in the system is aiding and abating, right? I agree, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> but for me, um, much more important than any other factor, what you need is a commit, is committed leadership. That's if you have somebody at the who means business. Now, I'm not belittling how you know, tricky this can be, because they can, like you rightly mentioned, is it possible that um, your NLC, for example, or the labor, you know, we, we fight any move to trim down the civil service and what have you. So that, you have that kind of challenge. You have people, you know, because you know you are, you are just a leader, and you have people, you know, working under you. And if they can, they can just look for ways to draw you, slow you down. But ultimately, if leadership has sincerity of purpose and commitment, it is a battle that can be won. For example, I do not believe that it's everyone in, the, in every civil service that, that's, that's corrupt or that, that, that you know that doesn't do their job well. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of parallelling with the right forces within the service, showing commitment, employing new people. You know, let, let everyone in the service know that there's a new sheriff in town. So the challenge we have is that leadership is not even committed enough. And then the people, the members of the of civil service themselves, you know, they're just so lazy and laid back, and it's just unfortunate. But I think that we will get there. We, 
maybe slow and steady progress. Yeah, but we, we can't definitely make progress. I want that. to key into your hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Daniel Dupe, yeah. Christian Mogu, our both legal practitioners. Thank you very much for being on the show, gentlemen. Yeah. All right, uh, we'll take our plus report for today, and when we return, I'll be giving you my take. The day commenced with several countries giving their country report to members of the ECOWAS parliament. Many of them accused Nigeria of bringing on to the economic hardship as the nation's borders remain closed. This, they say, is a breach of the ECOWAS protocol on free movement of persons and goods within the sub-region. This, however, did not go down well with lawmakers from Nigeria. We have a protocol. The protocol is very clear. No country in the Equus sub region is allowed to export into another country what it does not produce. Meaning, by our own actions, we want to be self sufficient, we do not want to be dumping grounds, we want to encourage production. And we cannot be subservient any longer at this time to what they call the superpowers of the nation, of the world. They will produce, have it still for a very long period of time. After a while, they use our conduit to take to our own countries. This is not accepted in Nigeria. And I believe, as good citizens and MPs, we should encourage our people to be productive. The population we have in this country should not just be a number in size, but a number that can be helpful to the nation of Africa and to the world. Mr. Speaker, respected colleagues, I want to beg of you to bring understanding to this matter. ETLS is what binds the across countries together. We grow indigenous foods, we grow manufacturing indigenous, and then we dump dump goods that we import from foreign countries. I have said it that today in, in, in the world, the Republic is the sixth largest importer of rice in the world. And the Republic have just 11 million people. So where is where, where the where is the rice going to? The rice is obviously coming to Nigeria. If it was only rice, we could even understand. Mm -hmm. But that rice comes with arms. Boko Haram through Niger, the other American who is from uh, Bere, everybody is getting arms from there. So we cannot fold our arms and see Nigeria destroyed. We cannot fold our arms and see agriculture in Nigeria destroyed. Agriculture is the largest employer of labor in Nigeria. Over 75% of Nigerians are in, are, are, are in agriculture. More than 50% of Nigerians live in rural areas. Now, if you grow your agriculture, it means that you are creating jobs for the jobless Nigerians. The more you allow rice to come into Nigeria, you are empowering Thailand, you are empowering Indonesia, Malaysia, China, and countries, and Vietnam, and the countries that are in we cannot control that. That's why we are here. Honorable Ibrahim Sadiq, a Nigerian parliamentarian, called member states to be considerate, highlighting the dangers of a disintegrated Nigeria, saying smuggling through the nation's borders has affected Nigeria immensely. My first deputy speaker has rightly pointed out we must be our brother's keepers, we must be our sister's keepers. There cannot be peace without justice. There cannot be development without peace. And God forbid, if this country, Nigeria, should go to war, there is no country in West Africa that can take us to drink even their water. Drinking water will be a thing of a serious problem in West Africa. So, as rightly pointed out, I wouldn't want to take, us, take much of our time because this issue is clear. We don't need to be sentimental about it. Let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, Nigeria is not the only country that first closed its border in Africa because of insecurity. The first Deputy Speaker of the ECOWAS Parliament, Honorable Idris Wasi, added that the border closure has helped reduce the smuggling of small arms and light weapons. From the day we closed this border, I want to say and confirm to the world that even the insurgents, so-called insurgents, have now been extinct. It has stopped. Because the same border is where the massive arms are coming through. Yet we have customs. They will package rice 
in the, uh, on the top. Inside it, they will put arms and bring it to a country. No country will, su will support that. The parliamentarians approved Nigeria's decision, bringing an end to a blame game between member states. Amadin Uyi, Plus TV Africa. It's time for my take. Annex says Nigerian laws have stopped it from cancelling the elections of Kogi State. We know that the recent Kogi elections were a total disaster. Even with the obvious killings and violence, complaints and pressure from local and international observers, INEC has said it's not their place, but the law courts that's preventing them from acting. Well, some people are saying this is an excuse that is inexcusable. But what are we going to do about it? A woman died. A family has lost someone. What do we really want for this our dear country, Nigeria? Are we really ready for the democracy that we are experiencing, that's if it is one, to grow? Or do we enjoy the mediocre level in which we operate? I mean, because in a democracy, laws and court orders must be obeyed. Elections have to be free, fair, and credible. And this can only happen if all hands are on deck. So we can't wash our hands off and sit on the fence uh, and hope that a miracle will happen. It takes all of us deciding to get things to work and work right. I am Mary Anacom, and it's been Plus Politics. <laughs>